So first of all, I, I think at the heart of it, vaccine development, to put it in really simplistic terms, is really giving your body a bacteria or a virus that's highly purified. So it's basically stimulating what would naturally be um, the, the way a disease would be contracted, but in a very controlled fashion, such that it's giving your body the ability and the time to raise antibodies and fight the infection naturally. And the reason it needs to be controlled is because it needs to be safe. You don't want a high viral load and so on. So at the crux of it, all vaccines aim to do what nature does right. itself. Uh, you know, all the people recovering from COVID, you know, they're getting exposed to the virus and they're raising antibodies and they're getting protected. So this is a way of simulating that. So all vaccines are aim to do that. If I had to classify vaccines into the categories that are uh, based on the technology platform, currently I would classify them into four. And I'm sorry if the scientists in the audience, there might be 10, but in my, the way I understand it in my head is into four buckets. So the first bucket is uh, viral vaccines that are inactivated. These can be whole virions or uh, the virus itself that's inactivated either chemically or through heat or through other mechanisms. And I believe Bharat Biotech's Covaxin follows that approach as do several others. The second bucket I would say is protein vaccines. So these are the spike proteins, which is the spike on the corona, giving it its name. Uh, there's the RBD, the receptor binding domain based proteins, which play a role in inhibiting the virus attaching itself to the ACE2 receptors in our body. So there's a whole host of vaccines that are targeting spike proteins or, uh, or the RBD. Uh, the third bucket, I would say, also targets spike proteins or RBD. So effectively, it's a protein approach, but it's also driven by new vectors either modified vaccine Ankaria or the ADVAC vectors um, and so on. And the fourth bucket I would say is the other and really novel technologies which are your DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines, which is basically uh, like a messenger, it's like coding, it's, it's um, aimed to deliver a code to your genes and to your RNA to start producing antibodies against the virus. Um, and frankly, it's extremely interesting platform technology, extremely exciting. And I think, you know, DNA and RNA vaccines have been in development for close to 15 years now. But this is really an opportune moment to, um, to test that technology. But unlike human beings, not all vaccines are created equal. And each of these come with their own sets of um, you know, um, challenges in order to develop, like Dr. Swaminathan pointed out, some of the new DNA and RNA vaccines need to be kept in minus 70 degrees. Now, these are programmatically extremely challenging. But I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, what we're doing to, um, you know, have an expeditious uh, vaccine. And in many ways, I agree with Dr. Ella that while there's no trade-off in science, we are collectively making some trade-offs because in reality you would expect a vaccine to be over 90% efficacious. But all of vaccine development, not just now, historically has to be viewed in the context of risk. Now when you had widespread polio, we agreed to take the risk that when you take OPV vaccine, one in X percentage get polio because of the vaccine. But that's because the risk of polio was so high. I think COVID is similar. The fact that WHO put out TPP requirements for 50 to 80% efficacy tells you the trade-off that we're willing to make, but never at the cost of safety, because the last thing you want to do is make a situation even worse. Now, coming to our own candidates, we've been working on an RBD protein candidate, and uh, the expression system we're using is yeast, it's pickier. It's uh, tried and tested. We've made hundreds of million doses of hepatitis B on that platform. And I think much like ourselves, many companies are choosing platforms that they are familiar with, that they have infrastructure for. Because the key to speed 
is, you know, 150 candidates are not going to be able to make the vaccine in hundreds of millions of doses. And I think that's very key, to marry the technology with the infrastructure and the track record and capability. Now, our choice of RBD was dictated by the infrastructure match that would best allow us to make vaccine as quickly as possible. And so far, uh, we're hitting, we're going to start phase one studies in September, but from the manufacturability perspective, we have enough data that assures us that we'll be in a position to produce 80 to 100 million doses a month of this vaccine from the get-go. I think that's crucial because in the early years, you're going to have a demand supply gap and allocations. Everybody is going to fight over it. So it's really important to be able to scale quickly. And when we talk about challenges, you know, we can discuss that. But in my mind, uh, the reason it will be expeditious is because we are making certain trade-offs in context of risk, but not in relation to safety. Uh, we may be making trade-offs in terms of the expectation on timing of protection because we may say, hey, it's okay if it protects us for one year, we'll take it yearly as opposed to a lifetime, uh, but really not at the cost of safety. And the second most important factor is having large-scale infrastructure that you can deploy these technologies into. I hope that... No, no, absolutely. In fact, uh, before we go to scale, before we talk about how like Dr. Swaminathan pointed out, you know, some countries tend to hold, you know, at the cost of developing nations, et cetera, before we go into that. I think one important question that, uh, uh, you know, uh, is currently... But it's not easy to deploy capacity with each other because of the way the regulatory system is set up. So if father wanted to say that, you know, B, you, you fill my pentavalence because, you know, I have COVID obligations, for us to do that, we have to potentially go through clinical trials, but it requires a lot of regulatory work and potentially six to eight months before we even are able to do that. So if we can shift the needle there, it allows more flexibility for us to be open, but I think in principle we all want to deploy infrastructure in a way that best serves humanity at a critical time like this. I think you put it really, really Pointedly. Krishna, would you like to also comment on this idea of collaboration? I just want to say that um, I'm glad you organized this meeting. We may be competing, all three of us, but we are all of us competing with infectious disease. Please keep in mind that we may compete in the marketplace, but we are all competing against infectious disease. That is common goal for all of us. You know, I mean, um, yes, Indian max man manufacturers need some time now to collaborate more. It's easy to collaborate with the U.S. and other people, but with India, it's a little difficult because we have a cultural problem. We don't trust our own brothers, that's unfortunately. So the culture has to change. But definitely that is required. But I want to say one more important point um, with, uh, in front of Honorable Minister. India is manufacturing 100 doses. Serum Institute is only making 30. 70% of other vaccines comes three manufacturers. Keep that in mind. That means 70% of India comes from three manufacturers. That means Hyderabad is nothing less than Serum Institute. Please keep in mind. As a single company, may be different, but our three manufacturers, we are more than uh, double the, than a Serum Institute as a com combined strength of Hyderabad. And I, I want to tell you that uh, partnership is now, the disease is getting complex. I think we need a partnership. We don't even, buy, we are buying from uh, tetanus from BE now. We said we have to stop importing things rather than we collaborate among ourselves. And I think it will start right now. I think the Minister has organized this meeting. It brings some comfort level to all of us also, in a way. But I can tell you one more thing. Telangana will lead innovation in India. Please keep this line tag. Okay? Telangana will lead the innovation of India. There is nothing less. Because it's not that because Minister is here, I'm telling you this. I'm seeing the ecosystem that we are building in. You see this sort of uh, ecosystem of manufacturing, R&D, very high intense. Bangalore gets unnecessarily a popularity of the media, but actually we, we have better ma, ma, better ecosystem than any other ca, state of the country. But I think we need to see, and actually we are done typhoid conjugate, first vaccine in the world. So that comes from Hyderabad. So a yeah, lot of vaccines, not even B is developing new vaccine, they are developing new vaccine. Everything is going to come from here. So there is nothing less than that, and I think we are nowhere less than any other companies in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. In fact, as, uh, since, since this morning, 
I've been hearing a number of things on the innovation front and how important uh, uh, innovation is in your line of work. We have T-Hub in our state. We have T-Works. You know, we have a bunch of other initiatives that start with T. But I've also realized this morning after talking out to all of you that T-Cells are equally important. You know, I think um, in, in this process, I think we have, we have one more uh, uh, sort of an addition to this T-Portfolio. But before I go into other, other questions and other points, I think a question to all three of you. I think each of you uh, should respond to this. See, India now and Indians now are looking forward to you guys with a lot of anticipation. We want the vaccine to be cheap and affordable. We want it to come yesterday, if not, you know, say a month from now. You know, that quickly we want it. We also want accessibility and like Dr. Swaminathan pointed out, we don't want hoarding happening. We don't want only the privileged and the rich in India to be getting the first shots and, you know, them to be safer than the others. So we cannot have that divide as well. But that is the ask, that is the demand. Now the question to you guys is, what can governments do? Because I just heard Mahima say, sometimes when I want to really change gears and move fast, the regulatory framework comes in the way. Be it in the state, be it the DCGI, be it Delhi. What do we know? What do we need to do as governments to enable you? Because like I said, you know, we are a developing country, we are a third world country, we can't invest lots and lots of money in research and development from the exchequer's uh, uh, or the consolidated money or the exchequer's money. But how do we facilitate, how do we encourage you, how do we take away the hurdles, how do we ensure these roadblocks in your regulatory approval processes are removed? The reason why I ask is because I want to appeal to government of India from the industry here, from the government here, taking into account all of your viewpoints and taking into account all of your ideas and suggestions. I want to write to them. I want to request them. I want to reach out to them and be your advocate for the industry in terms of ensuring that we compete with the world on an even keel. If the world is actually moving at a brisk pace, it is primarily because they don't have as many legal hurdles, as many regulatory hurdles as we have in India. So please do vent, please do talk, please do tell us what we need to change from within in state government here and also in Delhi, what are the things that you would like to see differently, starting with maybe Krishna, and then we go to Mahima and then to Anand. I think this is a very important point. The vaccine is unfortunately controlled 90 percent by the central federal government, central government. That is number one. What we need as a Telangana, if you want to become a global player, we need CDSO, which is Drug Control Office, to have decentralized the power to Hyderabad. We need a South India headquarters of CDSO in the South India so that it can be Hyderabad and that will strengthen because we don't have for a small players also. We are rushing to Delhi. It doesn't make sense for us. And, uh, and it's a country, it's a big country. And 60% uh, of the pharma is coming from here. So that naturally we need to have CDSO headquarters uh, decentralize some of the power, 90% of the power to be decentralized and located in Hyderabad. That will change the game for us, uh, for Telangana. Number two, RCGM, DVT. Again, that has to be decentralized, put a one small institute here, right in, uh, in a Junam Valley. They can be located here with the two offices. They clear everything, except the one BSL-3 area, highly contained uh, organism can go there. Remaining all can be done. Because this is the only country, even for small R&D, sir, we need a permission from DBD. I don't know, they are the facilitator of the country's industry, but they are also in the regulatory chair. That is hurting us, actually, very bad. For every small R&D material to import, we need a permission of our CGM. That is going to kill a lot of startup companies in this country. It is hurting us, actually, very bad. And I think our system, at least if they can't close down, at least they should be decentralized and put them here. Third important is, we, every batch that we send to CRI Kasoli, if they can set up in Hyderabad, one more testing, where state government can build that infrastructure and give it to them, they can have a testing facility here. If they do that, and I think we will we'll rule the uh, country. Thank you, Krishna. In fact, on the last point, the testing center has been approved for Hyderabad. It will be up and running hopefully soon. But uh, we'll hear from Mahima as well what she thinks needs to be done by governments in terms of removing these legal hurdles and regulatory hurdles. So first, sir, I would break it down into the more immediate things that can be done and some of the more institutional challenges which will take time to accomplish. But once we accomplish those, they will pave the way for more innovation, not just in the context of COVID. So first, in the context of COVID, I would really like to highlight funding. 
So most manufacturers sitting at this table don't have access. We're doing this at risk. We're doing this, you know, with commercial sources of capital. It's very challenging to do efficacy studies, global efficacy and safety studies, and invest in infrastructure when there's no pull mechanism that's visible. Now, the COVAX facility is one way where they're kind of trying to give you demand certainty, but that hasn't been forthcoming from our own government, which is a bit disappointing because we need to understand what the allocation strategy of the country will look like. Given all vaccines will not be available from day one, what is the volume you need for first responders? What is the volume you need in the second tranche? What is the overall immunization strategy? Is it 60% of the people? Is it 100% of the people? So these kinds of things, and I often use these terms, pull and push mechanisms, there are no pull mechanisms. In the absence of the pull mechanism, it makes the lack of push mechanisms even more extreme. Um, our funding is extremely fragmented uh, through BIRAC. Many countries, including China and the U.S., have fully funded at risk several programs, making sure that they have access to vaccines first, that they have access to a diverse portfolio of vaccines, and setting up, supporting companies to set up huge infrastructure. Now, this has long-term implications because India is the number one vaccine player in the world. In not many industries can we claim to have that advantage, and I worry that by empowering everyone else in this fashion and not empowering India, we are losing, in the long term, a certain competitive advantage to other countries. This is easily done. The World Bank has $2 billion in funding that they're making available specifically to vaccine manufacturers to expand their infrastructure. But India needs to agree on terms to access those funds and make them available to a handful of manufacturers who, they have, who have the track record to making this happen. So I've gone out on a limb here, but, uh, but I think funding is, is a key thing. The second are the regulatory challenges. And it's not in the day-to-day -day clearances because I have to say that uh, between uh, DBT and uh, the DCGI, they have been proactive in reaching out and saying, if you don't get clearance in 24 hours, so has the state of Telangana, you know, I get calls. <laughs> the reverse is happening, so it's actually kind of uh, um, interesting to be put on the other side of things. So it's not about the day-to-day, -day, but India still hasn't made clear the guidelines for what it means to license a vaccine. What efficacy parameters are you going to use? And FDA and WHO have published those guidelines. I know India is still working on the guidelines, but they haven't been published. This is really important because Break about this. For the government from the industry, I think these three things, if we can take care of, I think more and more can happen. I don't know if we still have Dr. Swaminathan with us. Uh, is she on, Shakti? Is she still with us? Dr. Swaminathan, I'm not sure if you're with us. Uh, if you are, ma'am, uh, I'd like to ask you one uh, quick question. Or before she joins us, in fact, uh, we can uh, possibly have, you know, uh, another, another question taken as well. Um, Mahima. One of the things, again, uh, that was discussed during the course of the discussion today is about capacities. Now, like you, you mentioned 80 to 100 million doses per month that potentially can be manufactured as and when you get the approval after phase three. We are a country of 1.3 billion people. I think the entire country is looking at vaccine manufacturers with a great deal of anticipation. How do you see the timelines in terms of rollout, in terms of uh, how our capacities can be expanded, et cetera, and how quickly can we ramp up to cover, firstly, obviously, the most vulnerable, and then maybe uh, uh, cover all sets of people across the country. How do, you, how do you see that panning out? So this really would vary from technology to technology, sir, because some technologies have uh, inherent limitations. So cell culture-based technologies are harder to scale. So for instance, if you're in cell cubes or cell factories, then you need to adopt to fermentation to be able to scale much more rapidly and quicker. So there's one on the drug substance side, what we call the upstream side. Um, and I think on the upstream side, the only way to scale in, uh, in a time-bound fashion 
one is to collaborate and to look to contract manufacturing capacity and so on and so forth. Because to set up a drug substance facility from scratch is going to take a minimum of 18 months. And I'm being extremely optimistic by saying it's 18 months. So that's not going to happen. So the only way is to look at, you know, who has microbial fermentation facilities? Who has cell culture facilities? How quickly can I collaborate? And if you see the AstraZeneca model, that's exactly what they've done. They have a manufacturing site in US, in Europe, and in India. So when we think about it, we need to think you know, more locally as well as globally to look at how we expand drug substance. In our case, we would be able to deploy other infrastructure or other programs, assuming that it doesn't cause a disruption to routine immunization. We could deploy other infrastructure to do campaigning. But one thing that remains common as an infrastructure that everybody needs is going to be fill finish capacity. Today, one of the big concerns is, will there be enough glass tubing? Will there be enough vials in which you put the vaccine? You know, we, we really haven't had this scale of uh, expansion or need for, um, for vials ever before. So for even the uh, back-end support manufacturers to be able to supply materials is still, a, is still going to be a challenge, something that we'll have to see, so, such that they are not allocating to the highest bidder, so to speak, right? But the one infrastructure that's common to all of us is fill finish infrastructure, because majority of these vaccines, barring a few which are nasal sprays or attempting to be nasal sprays, they're all injectable. And creating that additional fill finish infrastructure right now will enable us to deliver those 8 billion doses in the most rapid fashion possible because um, that will be rate limiting at one point where the drug substance can be scaled but you won't be able to fill it in, in vials. So from a manufacturing perspective, we're trying to do everything we can by looking at 20 dose presentation, 30 dose, having preservatives that, you know, will, will take us through a much larger while. But uh, what I've been, you know, trying to advocate for, particularly with DBT and such, including CEPI, is to say create a fund where people can access um, money to expand their fill finish infrastructure. And why is this a good thing? There's no downside risk. Even if your vaccine candidate doesn't work, you can ensure that that infrastructure is deployed for whichever vaccine candidate that works. So, you know, it's not a win or lose situation for the government to make a bet on. But these are very critical to be able to rapidly scale. And the third thing and very important factor is availability of trained manpower. Right now, we envision uh, creating an additional 500 uh, jobs within the next six months. Uh, but we really need skills, uh, skilled workforce, and, and that's a long-term thing as well. But these three things will enable us to rapidly scale. Thank you, Mahima. In fact, uh, I think it's not a zero-sum game, is what Mahima says from the government perspective. Krishna, before people, that needs to be planned. Now, since this is the first time all three of you are coming together onto a platform, I, we, we, we did a little bit of a survey. Uh, you know, we, I tweeted, I said, you know, what are the questions that uh, you would like answers to, etc. The one question that came on tops, which I think you all can guess, that will be the last question for all three of you. See, it's like looking at a crystal maze and answering this one. Maybe, maybe you have more uh, solid basis and solid uh, uh, grounding to answer this than any of us in this, in this room right here. We'll start with uh, uh, Mahima, uh, Mahima. Everybody's, the question that is on everybody's mind, when is the vaccine likely to come out, right? And how long is it going to be effective for? I think <laughs> it's a tough question, I know, but I think I would want your educated, uh, you know, because since you're in this, since you've been in this business for decades, I want a very simple, to the point answer on, when do you think it will happen, and how do you think it's going to pan out from there on? Between Q1 next year and Q3 next year, you should start to see at least five candidates get licensed. Q1 and Q3? Yeah. That is January? Jan to anywhere between, the third quarter. Anywhere and, and, and this I mean anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, yeah. of course. Yeah. So I think that. 
how long really the epidemiology of the virus is not known. So will it be a seasonal, like, like a flu shot that you have to take every year because it's mutated enough that it warrants redevelopment? Or is there enough uh, persistence to last a year? Now, one of the trade-offs is everybody wants a single-dose vaccine because it's easy to administer. Now, all single-dose vaccines may not be as persistent. So it's really a trade-off between number of doses, persistence, and all of that. Time will tell. I'm afraid I couldn't predict uh, anything on persistence at this so point. So Q1 to Q3, and you, you're saying it could yeah. either be in the form of a annual shot like for flu, or it could be a, depending on could be the epidemiology, years, could be a five-year. Depends. We won't... Typically, we would have done this all before licensure, but given the risk we're doing, you know, we're going ahead in licensing, so we'll only know post-licensure of a vaccine how long the duration of protection lasts. All right. Thank you. And uh, let's go to Anand. Anand, uh, 